So what is continuity? What does it mean for a function to be continuous? Well, if a function is continuous everywhere in its domain, it means that it has no interruptions and it's unbroken. So this would mean there's no jumps, no holes, or any gaps of any kind. So let's take a look at these three graphs in front of us to get an idea of what continuity means. So let's consider the interval from one through six on the three graphs below. And if you're not familiar with this notation, it means that we're gonna be looking at the x values from one through six, including one and six. That's what these brackets here mean, that we're including the endpoints, as well as all of the numbers in between those two endpoints. So for example, on our first graph here, we're gonna be looking at all the x values from x equals one to x equals six. But now let's actually look at our first graph here and discuss its continuity. So if I start at x equals one and I follow the graph all the way over to x equals six, I notice that there's no breaks, there's no jumps, no holes, or any interruptions of any kind. It is perfectly continuous all the way from x equals one to x equals six. So in this case, I would say the graph is continuous on all points of the interval from one to six. So then let's look at our second graph here. We'll do the same thing. We're gonna start at x equals one and we'll follow it until we get to x equals six and see if we find any interruptions in the graph. So I'll start here at x equals one and I'll follow all the way up to x equals three. So far so good. But now there's this gap here. We have a jump. We go from y equals six right here and then we jump down to y equals two. So right here at x equals three, we have a bit of a problem because we have an interruption in the graph where we were at one y value at a particular x value, but now we're at another one. We have this interruption that we have to deal with. And so we can make the conclusion that this function isn't going to be completely continuous on the interval, but let's look at this from a calculus perspective in order to describe why it's not continuous for the entire interval. So if we look at the limit as x approaches three for the function, and we looked at each side, right? From the right side, we're approaching y equals two. And from the left side, we're approaching y equals six. We find that the left and the right side limits don't match up, they're not equal. And so then we'd have to say the limit from both sides does not exist in this case. And so that is a huge indicator that there's an interruption in our graph. If a limit doesn't exist somewhere, then that means there must be an interruption of some kind. And therefore, this isn't going to be continuous everywhere on the interval. So in this case, we can write not continuous at x equals three. So then let's look at our third graph here. This one's a little bit different. We'll start with our x equals one and we'll follow the graph until we get to x equals three where we have a hole, which is considered as an interruption. So that's going to be a problem, but we'll come back to that. And then we continue to follow it until we get to x equals six and it seems continuous up till that point. So our only problem here, once again, is that x equals three. So this hole at x equals three is an interruption. It's considered as breaking up our graph in a way that it isn't completely continuous on the given interval. In fact, one of the things that we can note right away is that the value at x equals three is going to be undefined because of that hole. So I'm gonna make a note of that first and say that the value of the function at x equals three is undefined. And that is also going to be a huge indicator of whether something is continuous or not at a point. But then once again, let's look at this from a calculus perspective and let's talk about the limit as x approaches three of this function. So let's write that, the limit as x approaches three for the function. And let's look at this from the right side and the left side and see if they are the same. So if we follow the function from the right side, we find ourselves at y equals three when we're at x equals three, so we're right here. And then if we go from the left side, we also find ourselves at y equals three when we're at x equals three. So in this case, the left and right side limits are equal. So we do have a limit in this case of three. But notice that this limit isn't equal to the value of the function at x equals three. It's a defined value when the actual value of the function is undefined. So this isn't equal to f of three. And so when the limit of the function is not equal to the value of the function at a certain point, that's going to be an indicator of when a function might not be continuous at a particular point, specifically that point that we're looking at the limit of as well as the value of on the function. But what if we did have a value of three? What if three was defined? Let's say right here at y equals six. So this would be the point 
3, 6. What do we do now? Is our function continuous now? Well, no, not quite. Because even though 3 is defined now at this point, the limit as x approaches 3 is still going to be different from the actual value at x equals 3. Because in this case, now f of 3 is equal to 6. But 6 is not the same as 3, which is our limit as we approach 3. And so they're still different. And so we still have an interruption here where it looks like we're heading towards one y value, but then we jump to another y value only to jump back and continue our graph. So it's an interruption and our function is going to be not continuous at that x equals 3. So I'll write that again. It's going to be not continuous at x equals 3. So we looked at these three graphs in order to get an idea of what makes a function not continuous. And now that we've seen some different examples of where it is continuous, where it's not continuous, we can make some generalizations for if a function is continuous at a certain point on its function. So let's look at those. So what we can say is that a function is continuous at a point x equals c, where c is any point along the x-axis, if, one, the function is defined at x equals c. So what that means is if I plug in c into the function or whatever value of x that is, I get a real result and not an undefined value. So then two is a function is continuous at a point x equals c if the limit as x approaches c for that function exists. We saw in our second graph earlier that if the limit doesn't exist at a certain point, then it's not going to be continuous at that point. So that leads us to our second point here, that a limit has to exist at a point in order for the function to be continuous there. And then three, the limit as x approaches c for the function must be equal to the value of c on that function. So when we plug in our value c into our function, we should get the same thing that we get when we look at the limit from both sides. If all three of these things are true for x equals c on a function, we can say that it is continuous at that point x equals c. And then an extra note, if a function is continuous everywhere, meaning every single point on that function is continuous, there's no breaks, there's no gaps, no interruptions of any kind, we would say that that function is everywhere continuous. So in that case, a function that is continuous everywhere on the real line from negative infinity to infinity is everywhere continuous, is what we call that. Examples of functions that are everywhere continuous would include functions like x, x squared, x cubed, and functions like that. But there's so many more than the ones that I just named. So now that we talked about what makes a function continuous, we have to talk about, well, what happens if it's not continuous at those points? How do we classify those discontinuities is what we call them. So if a function is not continuous at a point x equals c, then we say it has a discontinuity at that point c. And what's interesting about discontinuities is there's two different types. There's what we call removable discontinuities and non-removable discontinuities. So let's first talk about removable discontinuities. And what it means for a discontinuity to be removable is that if we can take a function that has a discontinuity and redefine it to make it continuous, then that discontinuity is removable. And so here's an example. If we have the function x squared minus one over x minus one, we'll see that we have a discontinuity at x equals one, because if we plugged one into the function, we would get a denominator of zero. Our value would be undefined. However, if we were to factor the top, with our difference of squares, we have x minus one and x plus one, that would be all over x minus one, we can remove this term, this x minus one, we cancel it out, and then our function is equal to x plus one. So what we were able to do there is completely remove that discontinuous part of the function. So now we're left with x plus one, where now we can plug in one and get two. It's no longer discontinuous at one. So that means that we were able to remove the discontinuity from this function. So what that means is that for the function f of x, we have a discontinuity at x equals one, but it's removable. So then we have non-removable discontinuities. And so a non-removable discontinuity is a discontinuity that cannot be removed, which means we cannot redefine a function to make it continuous everywhere or just continuous at that point. And an example of this would be the function x over x minus one. 
we have a discontinuity at x equals 1 here as well, because if we plug 1 into this, we would get 0 on the denominator. It would be an undefined value. But notice this time, unlike up here, we were able to factor and reduce our equation. There's nothing we can do here. This is in its simplest form. And so, no matter what we do to this function, we're not going to be able to remove that discontinuity at x equals 1. So in this case, we would say we have a discontinuity at x equals 1, but it's non-removable. So now let's look at some examples. Let's see if these functions are continuous, and if they're not continuous at certain points, what kind of discontinuities do we have? Let's start with f of x equals 2x minus 1. And we'll notice that no matter what value of x we plug into this function, we're not going to have any undefined value. And as you can see from the graph, it's just going to keep going forever. There's no holes, there's no gaps, no interruptions of any kind. And so we would say that this function is everywhere continuous and has no discontinuities. So we would say that it's continuous on the interval negative infinity to infinity, which means it's continuous everywhere on the real line, from infinitely small values of x to infinitely large values of x. And to briefly mention our limits, if we were to look at the limit at any point on this function or on this graph, we would see that the limit would be equal to the actual value of the point on that function. So once again, from our limit perspective, it's still continuous everywhere. But if we look at the function 1 over x, it's a different story. We can see from the graph right away that at x equals 0, we have a vertical asymptote where the limit doesn't exist and the function is never going to be 0. No matter what happens, if we plug 0 into this function, we're going to have an undefined value. So in this case, f of 0 is undefined, which means we have a discontinuity at x equals 0. So I'll write that. We have a discontinuity at x equals 0. And this is going to be non-removable because if you look at your function here, there's nothing we can do to the function to remove that discontinuity. That x equals 0 is always going to be not continuous. So we would then say that this is non-removable. And I'm just going to abbreviate that, but you know what I mean. So then unlike this function, this is not continuous everywhere. It's going to be continuous on the interval negative infinity to 0 not including zero, unioned with zero to infinity. And hopefully you're familiar with that interval notation from your pre-calculus courses. Finally, let's look at the function x squared minus one over x plus one. We actually looked at a function similar to this earlier, so maybe it's a little bit of a spoiler of what's going to happen here, but let's just take a look at the graph. We'll notice that it seems continuous until we get to x equals negative one, where we have this hole. And upon investigating the actual function, you'll see that if we plug in negative 1, we're going to get an undefined value on the bottom because negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So we're going to have 0 on the denominator, which means that function will be undefined at that value. However, can we redefine the function so that that discontinuity is gone? Can we remove it? And the answer is yes. If we take this function and we factor it so that our difference of squares becomes x plus 1 and x minus 1, over x plus 1, we can then cancel these two x plus 1 terms and be left with x minus 1 as our function. If we did that, we could actually remove this hole right here. I could erase that hole and just complete the line. It would be continuous everywhere because x minus 1 is an everywhere continuous function. No matter what value of x I plug into it, I'm going to get a value of y. So then we would say that this function has a discontinuity at x equals negative 1 and it's removable. And then for the function, we can say that the function is continuous on the interval negative infinity to negative 1, not including negative 1, unioned with negative 1 to infinity. Once again, hopefully you are familiar with using that interval notation. Because all it means is that this function is continuous for values of x that are really, really, really small to negative 1, and then from negative 1, to infinity, to increasingly larger values of x. So everywhere except negative 1, this function is continuous. And once again, just to quickly remind you about how we use limits in this scenario, if we looked at the limit at x equals negative 1, we would come to a conclusive limit of y equals negative 2, even though the value of the original function is undefined at that value. And so that would also be an indicator that we have a discontinuity at x equals negative 1.
All right, and that's all I had for this lesson about continuity. Hopefully you enjoyed this discussion as we looked at what makes a function continuous at certain points and what makes a function discontinuous, the different types of discontinuity, and hopefully it all made sense. If it didn't and you have some questions, feel free to put them in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, you can move on and look at some more examples in the example video, which I'll have linked in the description as well as being at the end of this video for you to click on. So until then, I'll see you next time.